we will kick off um, this morning's session, but again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Daniela Perry. I serve as the Vice President of the Georgia Chamber Foundation um, for the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. I want to give a special thanks to our anchor investors um, who really are the backbone of Max and help make all of our programs possible. Um, special thanks to Georgia Express Link Partners, which is our newest anchor investor. Um, but certainly if you see or interact with any of the organizations on um, this page, um, including the state of Georgia, that's the Department of Human Resources, um, please thank them for um, their investment in workforce development in the metro Atlanta area. So again, my name is Daniela Perry. I'm excited to kick off this session. Um, we've got Nye Hodge, who's with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, to talk about a new report they've got out around the digital skills divide. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen real quick, let Nye get his up. But Nye, just a big thanks to you and the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for all y'all do to provide incredibly good um, research and insights. And thanks again for being with us this morning. Of course, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the invite. And most importantly, thank you audience for joining us. Um, so early on a Friday morning, I appreciate you guys trickling in uh, for me to share this presentation on digital skills. Um, and sorry, I have like the wrong date up here. Ignore that date. <laughs> but all right, let's see if I can get full screen. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna be presenting today on closing the, the closing the digital skill divide. As Daniela mentioned, this is a report that came out earlier this year. It's a report that's in partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta and National Skills Coalition. But before I dive into the report, I'm gonna read a quick disclaimer. The views expressed today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta or the Federal Reserve System. quickly going to talk about why the Federal Reserve is looking at things like digital right? Uh, so most people know the Federal Reserve right now is fighting inflation, right? And that's what the Federal Reserve is commonly known for, controlling interest rates. Little known fact is that the Federal Reserve also does community development type work, right? So the Federal Reserve has two mandates, stable prices and maximum employment. And so I work in community and economic development working on issues that are barriers to maximum employment, right? So for example, digital skills, having digital skills gap in the economy, having folks who don't have the right skills necessary to get the jobs that are in demand can be a hindrance to achieving maximum employment. So we do all kinds of research from workforce research, housing research, food insecurity, um, climate-based research, things that, that can affect the labor market, right? And so that's what we're doing here today. Another reason why the National Skills Coalition and the Federal Reserve wanted to look at digital skills specifically is because of all the funding that's going to be coming down or that it has begun to come down around digital skills training, digital skills access, digital equity, um, through the Digital Equity Act, through the BEAT Act. We wanted to be able to give states and workforce an evidence base to advocate for funding for their states, advocate for funding for their programs, and to help create training programs to close the digital skills gap in their local labor markets. And so I'll be presenting today published and unpublished results from the report. So you guys will see things. If, you, if you've seen the report, thank you so much for reading it and checking it out. If you haven't seen it, uh, it'll be a great time to look at the report after this presentation. You'll have a good foundation of what's in the report. And you'll, like I said before, you'll get things that are not published in the report. So you're kind of getting a behind the scenes, look at some data that just didn't make the report. And so the data underlying this report it comes from Lightcast. Uh, full disclosure, I used to work at Lightcast. I was there for about two years when they were called Burning Glass. Uh, they recently merged and rebranded, and now they're called Lightcast. Uh, but Lightcast is a uh, work, uh, is a, um, how would I describe it? Lightcast is a uh, economic firm that looks at job postings data. They aggregate job postings from online. They, make, they use artificial intelligence to make sense of the words that are in the job postings. Um, and they're able to parse out the skills that are needed for, in jobs, the occupations that are being demanded, the industries. Uh, there's a ton of data and useful, a lot of great insights that come out of the Lightcast data set and about jobs, about the job that, about the jobs and skills that employers are demanding. And so this is the data that underlie this report. 
So when we went into this report, we went in to do this analysis, we had no preconceived notions, we didn't know what we would find, but what we found was that 92% of jobs require digital skills. We didn't expect to find 92%. We expected to find some number, but we didn't expect it to be as high as 92%. And so how that 92% number breaks down, you'll see on the top, on the top, 27% of jobs require what we call definitely digital skills, and 45% require what we call likely digital skills. And only 8% of jobs, right? A very small, under 10%, right? Only 8% of jobs don't require any digital skills. And so what's this breakdown between definitely digital and likely digital? So a definitely digital skill gonna be skills like computer literacy, Salesforce, Microsoft Office, things that you need a computer, you need a digital device to, to, to perform that task, right? A likely digital skill are things like scheduling, teaching, patient care, things that you're probably using some kind of digital device or digital task to do the role but it's a good, but it, it can also be done analog, right? And because we're using a data set, we're not, this wasn't based on qualitative interviews. We can't say for sure whether or not a teacher, for example, is not using any digital skills, but we suspect that probably most teachers today, especially since the pandemic, are using digital skills. So our hunch, even though we didn't do any qualitative interviews, like I said, to confirm, our hunch is that these likely digital skills are probably being done digitally, right? Scheduling, I don't, there might be some employer or boss out there who wants their admin to do a schedule by, by paper and pen, but we think most folks are probably using some kind of computer-based uh, scheduling platform to do scheduling, right? So 92% of jobs require digital skills and, this stat, and that's saturated across the US, right? That's not limited to your New York, not limited to your California, or your Washington, right? It's gonna be across the country, right? And as we see uh, where Georgia is, 92% of jobs in Georgia are requiring some form of digital skills, right? Even in uh, some of the some of our smaller states, right? Digital skills are needed across the country. So it's not limited to sort of your big metro states. And again, it's across industries, right? So we know that, uh, so the tech sector sits in the information industry. We know that tech requires digital skills skills, right? So 99% of jobs in the information industry require digital skills. No surprise there. That's where your, your tech jobs are. That's where your software jobs are. Finance and insurance, you know, a lot of those jobs require digital skills. The most interesting, uh, 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 the most interesting, I guess, measures or, or metrics here are going to be on the bottom right, I think, right? So transportation and warehousing. 77% of jobs in transportation and warehousing require digital skills. Not something that's not commonly uh, uh, um, expected, right? Construction jobs, 91% of jobs are requiring digital skills. Utilities, right? So these industries where folks, where, you, where we don't traditionally suspect their digital skills, there is a huge demand for digital skills. Manufacturing here in the middle, 93%. And digital skills are, are required regardless of education, right? So we have a breakout here that looks at demand for definitely digital skills, which is your solid orange line uh, bar. And then likely digital skills, which is your striped bar, right? So we kind of broke it out here for some additional uh, clarity. So looking at the left side of the slide first, we see that as you increase in education, you go from high school to associates to bachelors, demand for definitely digital skills goes up to almost 75%. As you get the master's and PhD, it kind of goes down a little bit, but my hunch is that the masters and PhD folks are having the bachelor's degree folks doing all the the research and all the work, right? Uh, so re regardless of education requirement, there's going to be some demand. There's a there's huge demand for digital skills. And when we look to the right side, similar breakout, likely digital, definitely digital. But now we're looking at years of experience. Folks early in their career, about half one in one in two jobs require definitely digital skills. And 46% require likely digital skills. And again, those likely digital are probably going to be digital, right? As that goes up, you see that the demand for definitely digital as you move up in your career, demand for digital skills increases. And digital skills pay. That's one, uh, a lot of people love seeing this slide. It's one of the biggest things that people call out in the report is just how much more workers stand to gain 
by acquiring digital skills. So this is actually Georgia specific data. So workers in Georgia earn more when they require more digital skills. Jobs in Georgia without digital skills, that this is uh, median, uh, uh, about $16.50. $16, when you get your first digital skill, the, the median uh, pay wage, pay uh, or hourly wage is $21.25, right? And so that's about a 30% increase. When you go from one to five, 70% increase. Five to nine, 32% increase, right? So the more digital skills you acquire, uh, the more like the, do you have a bigger chance of earning more. Not only do workers earn more, but states and uh, states and federal government earns more through income taxes, right? We all pay taxes. The more we earn, we know that those tax dollars start getting higher. Uh, so this example is actually for North Carolina. This is what's in the report. Uh, depending on family con uh, family composition, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you have kids, uh, states and the federal government stand to earn anywhere from about fourteen hundred to just under three thousand dollars in additional tax revenue. Right when folks move from no digital skills to just one digital skill, this is just an average estimate, right? And so think about this being multiplied out by the hundreds of thousands or by the millions, right? So this not only do workers benefit, but also government benefits through taxes, right? And that's especially important given these last few years with all the spending that has been going on. You know, a lot of states uh, have, um, uh, you know, have been spending a lot of money with, you know, COVID and these different things have been happening recently. Uh, so this is a way that states can sort of recover some of that, some of that, some of that revenue. Hey, now I just wanted to pause real quick. Um, we got one question in the chat about the previous slides um, inquiring if that was all Georgia specific data as well um, or kind of showed the national picture. Gotcha. So great question. And, and, I'm, and I meant to say, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. I'm happy to, uh, to stop and pause on any particular slide to dive deeper. Uh, great question. And I should have clarified that. Uh, this slide, there, most of these slides are actually going to be U.S. specific. Um, and I'll call out the ones that are Georgia specific. Sounds great. Thanks, Nine. Awesome. And so here we're looking at specialty skills, right? And specialty skills do pay more, right? And so we're just breaking out the previous slide and looking at it by foundational, which is blue. This is sort of everything, the gray line, the gray bars, and then green are your specialty skills. So as we see as well, right, the more specialty skills you earn, you have, uh, the, the higher your pay compared to foundational skill. So what is a foundational skill? What is a specialty skill? So these are some of the most requested, um, uh, definitely digital skills. Um, and, it's, and it's showing sort of the, the pay, the average pay or the average the median pay that jobs with these skills are earning. And so on the left side here, we're seeing our foundational skills. So things like PowerPoint, emailing, social media, you know, being able to you know, do some digital marketing on social media. Uh, computer literacy is a big one. Computer literacy is actually one of the most demanded foundational skills in Georgia. We see on the right side, we have those specialty skills. Some spe and at the very top, we have things like machine learning, software development, Python, you know, it's a coding platform. Of course, those skills are going to be paying a lot more. We have things like Tableau, where folks can make um, uh, data visualizations, right? Putting together reports, uh, data analysis, Salesforce, the, you know, as you, these specialty skills, as they begin, as they become more specialized, uh, require, demand a higher salary. So these are the most in-demand foundational skills in Georgia. So computer literacy, typing, data entry, word processing, and these seem, these seem pretty basic, but I think as I, as I go through some slides later on, we'll see how these are actually the building blocks to jobs, right? The building blocks to that 92% of jobs requiring digital skills. These are some of the um, industry specific skills that with strong demand in Georgia, right? So we have just some select industries, finance and insurance. I'll just, I won't read through all the skills. I'll let, I'll let the slide sit for a few seconds, um, but we're highlighting finance and insurance. We're highlighting healthcare, manufacturing, retail, So again, these are some of the top industry specific digital skills with strong demand here in Georgia. 
And so computer literacy, I think, I hope, I hope that I've laid out that, you know, the data is showing that there's huge demand for digital skills across jobs, right? It's not just in the tech sector. And so now I want to sort of lay out what this looks like in the real world, right? We went through the data and that's great, but it's always good to, uh, to be able to, to apply it back to what we see day to day, right? Uh, so computer literacy, right? Why is computer literacy so important? And actually we see, we're seeing more jobs since the pandemic requiring computer literacy because I think employee, well, the, some of the interviews that I've done with employers, they're realizing that, you know, they didn't put computer literacy in job descriptions in their job posts, right? Expect, because they assume that most folks, they didn't they, they assume most folks had that, they didn't have to put that. But now employers are starting to put computer literacy more into their job postings because they're realizing as they have shifted to more di to doing things more digitally since the pandemic, a lot of workers actually don't have those basic digital literacy skills, right? So what does that mean? Basic troubleshooting, right? Uh, I talked to a director of HR for a small manufacturing company up in New Jersey. They switched over their their sales, their their, their field sales representatives to iPads, only to find out that majority of them did not know how to troubleshoot an iPad. They didn't know how to connect the iPad to the mobile hotspot uh, when the iPad wasn't working or when the, the, the sales platform on the iPad wasn't working. They didn't know how to troubleshoot it. So it caused a lot of issues in the field. They were calling back to base and they didn't have an IT person on staff. So it caught, ended up causing more trouble than it was worth. Well, I wouldn't say more trouble than it was worth, but end, ended up causing more trouble than they realized switching over to iPads uh, because their staff just didn't have that basic computer literacy to under, to sort of navigate some of the common troubleshooting things that might come up when you're dealing with a mobile device, right? And that's not just limited to mobile devices, that's gonna be just you know a, a computer or a laptop as well, right? Computer literacy is also, you know, Microsoft Office is also one of the most common skills that are, that are being requested in job postings, right? So can you build a report in Microsoft Word? Uh, can you use Excel to 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 to, to make charts and to uh, and to do some basic um, uh, data analysis, right? Can you use Outlook to do scheduling, to send out emails, PowerPoint to actually present your work and to build presentations, right? So understanding these sort of building blocks, these com computer literacy allows you to then, if you have a basic knowledge of how Microsoft Office works and you understand how to go through the settings and all the different tabs. You know how to connect to Wi-Fi. You can you can you know navigate pretty confidently. You know a mobile device or your computer. There's a good chance that when you go into a job that you can do some basic troubleshooting of your 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 company specific platform, right? And also just want to shed the misconception, right? A lot of folks think that younger workers, Gen Z, because they're on social media, because they can connect to Netflix that they know how, that they have basic computer literacy as it relates to, to getting a job. And that's and that's definitely not the case, right? That's a misconception. So at the top, I have connecting to Netflix does not equal computer literacy. And the, the exclamation point equal sign is actually a coding term that means it's not equal, right? right? So, you know, just because you know, younger folks, you know, like I said, know how to troubleshoot things does not necessarily mean that they have those job specific computer literacy skills. And so just want to take some time to shed that misconception because that's often a missed market uh, that's that's not thought about because it's assumed that they already have those those skills. And so how, so building on those foundational skills, we start to see how uh, folks are using right computer digital skills in the workplace. So we interviewed some nurses for this when we were doing this when we were uh, actually this goes back to the very beginning of this project where we were trying to decide if, so we actually hand-coded, we looked at about, I think it was 14,000 skills. And we actually hand-coded myself and my two co-authors, we actually hand the skills from the Lightcast data set. And we, we don't know everything, right? We didn't know some of these medical skills. So we actually talked to nurses, we talked to people in healthcare to find out if the, if the skills that they have, the, the skills that are showing up in these job postings, are they digital? And the nurses that we talked to, for example, were saying like, no, my job is not digital. They didn't think of themselves as having digital jobs. But as we talked to them more, they realized like, oh, wait, yeah, my job is digital. I do all my patient charting and patient tracking their outcomes. That's all on a computer platform. All the machines and equipment that we have 
uh, in, 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 the, in the patient's room, those are all digital, right? So to get medicines out of the, I guess, the repository, right? That's all digital, right? They have to use a system to request the medicine that they need to be able to administer to folks, right? And they also said that they, a lot of the troubleshooting, they have to do that first line troubleshooting, right? They don't have time to call an IT person or get on the phone to call a tech person. When a, when a machine is not working, you have a patient that needs care, right? So they realize that actually our jobs actually are pretty digital. When you go to restaurants, to when you go to restaurants today, right? You see a lot, a lot more restaurant uh, uh, staff are, are placing orders or putting in your order through a mobile device, an iPad or an iPhone. And that actually allows for real-time inventory management, right? So they're putting in your order and that on the back end, that's tracking the, the restaurant's supply, right? What do we have left over? What don't we have? What do we need to order more? They're also clocking in and out on mobile devices, right? So yeah, again, we're building on you know that 92% number and, and showing that it's not just in tech, that it's everywhere, right? We're all right now on Zoom. This is digital, right? So we also have we all have we all have some computer uh, uh, literacy and knowledge to be able to get on, get on to you know to log into our computer, to turn it on, put in the password, connect to Wi-Fi, you know, click the Zoom link, connect to the Zoom, turn the camera on and off. All these things are all digital skills. And so we have to stop thinking about digital skills as just being, you know, coding. And things of that nature, it's 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 really uh, ubiquitous throughout our labor market, right? Uh, another example, we talked to um, a trucking company again in the pandemic. They switched over to using iPads, right? They were doing things by paper and pen, uh, but they were trying to limit contact, and so they switched over to iPads again, only to find that a lot of their drivers didn't have uh, those skills to really use the iPads, and they had to end up paying for training to get folks. Uh, the the skills they needed, um, you know, to to be able to utilize those iPads, and places like even Airbus. This is a picture from Airbus, uh, and they use they are using augmented reality to train their workers um, on on their systems, right? So ensuring that you know use using simulations to ensure that you know engines are going to work properly, right? To, to, tra to train their staff, it's probably a lot more cost-effective to use augmented reality to train workers and using, using actual real equipment, right? Uh, ag tech workers, as you all probably know, are using a lot of um, uh, digital devices and technologies to ensure that crop production is efficient, that they're running their farms efficiently. Digital skills come in there as well. Welders, for example, right? This is a picture from Smooth Robotics. More increasingly, more welders are using robotics and different types of digital technologies uh, to improve their jobs, right? So, well, so we have cobots, right? Robots that are working alongside humans. And again, this isn't this in this particular case, right? We're not seeing a job replacement by a robot. We're seeing someone using the robot to improve their uh, efficiency and their productivity in the job or an employer employing, you know, using robots to improve their workers' productivity, right? Um, and so we can, uh, the next couple of slides are gonna go into some sort of policy, I guess, levers that, that can be used to sort of help close the digital divide. But I do see some questions in the chat. So I'm gonna see if I, if there are some things that I can quickly address before going in sort of like the next stage of the presentation. So just yeah, give me right. we had one yeah. specifically about some of the industries that you showed and had questions about um, transportation and warehousing. If y'all had some specific insights there and could kind of share what y'all are seeing. Yeah, so the for transport, yeah, exactly. So um, here we have the slide pulled up here. So 77% yeah, of the jobs in trans transportation and warehousing are requiring digital skills. And so I'll caveat this, right? Um, a lot of this is has has been a change since since the pandemic, um, and so what we're seeing more and more of now is again right. A, a lot of employers are switching over to these digital devices, using iPads for inventory management. Right, uh, truckers having to to clock their clock their time, you know, and and their routes are all now you know going through iPads and things of that nature. Um, we there was a lot of noise in the data. Um, in terms of trying to go like further back to see like how much it has changed. 
Um, so we couldn't go too far back just because this, there was noise and data. We wanted to make sure that we had, uh, we were putting out results that were free of as much noise as possible. Uh, so it's hard to sort of um, to say what it was uh, maybe like five or 10 years ago. Uh, but today we're seeing that 77% of jobs in transportation and warehousing are requiring digital skills. Um, and if there's a specific act there, um, I'm happy to dive into it more. Um, but I think mostly, like I said, from talking to employers, as they have switched over because of the pandemic, they're, they were seeing those issues with employers not, uh, sorry, workers not having those sort of foundational skills. No, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing too is that every employer is just making more and more of those investments. So what y'all are talking about in the research, I think is just going to, you know, continue to explode. Um, so exactly. And, and we suspect, and we, and we'll run this analysis, we'll update the numbers um, in maybe another a year or two, but, you know, just talking to employers, like I said earlier, you know, a lot of them are requesting, are, they're actually putting more and more employees are putting computer literacy in their job postings because they realize that it's a thing that, um, a lot of workers don't have, and that can become a barrier to employment now, right? Jobs that folks didn't ex like trucking and warehousing is not, tra sorry, transportation and warehousing, being a truck driver is not a job that folks commonly attach with needing digital skills, but employers now are expecting that, right? Working in a restaurant is not a job that's commonly attached with needing digital skills, but employers now are requesting that. They're really, employers are realizing through the pandemic, the efficiency gains from having sort of digital uh, integration in in their uh, in in their you know in in their uh, organization, and so those basics not having those basic skills can be a, a hindrance and a barrier to employment. No, absolutely. I think that's what you know. I think we're all seeing people think about you know maybe we're removing a degree requirement, but maybe it's that skill requirement that's kind of coming back in. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it. I don't know. It's it's again from like a research perspective, super interesting to watch. When you're in the practitioner's point, it's a little more confusing. Um, but all good things to be aware of and um, mindful of. We do have one more question. We've gotten so far. Um, you, you know, talking about having the digital skills is so important. But um, you know, some funding sources for programs, you know, are kind of more focused on the soft skill side. So this may be a good segue into kind of some of those like policy recommendations and what y'all are seeing, um, but, you know, kind of how y'all are, what are y'all experiencing and seeing in terms of funding, specifically digital skills versus other hard skills versus like a, a more traditional soft skill, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So this is actually a great segue into the uh, policy levers that are available. So I'll answer that question as we go through the slides, right? Uh, so as I'm probably pre preaching to the choir here, but obviously we have the Digital Equity Act and the BEAT Act that have been passed by Congress that is providing funding for digital skills training. Um, so obviously, you know, states and workforce practitioners and providers, uh, training providers uh, can apply for these, um, can, can apply for these funds to create training programs that close the digital, digital, digital skills gaps. Uh, but these training programs, right, they don't have, they're not, they have a digital requirement, right? You have to be teaching some kind of digital skill, but we know that digital skills aren't um, the only skill that you need in the workforce, right? And so when you look at the legislation, it doesn't say that 100% of the program has to be digital skills training. It says it has to, it has to include digital skills training, right? So your training programs can include digital skills training. They can include soft skills, which, is, which are also right, a requirement to get jobs. Um, and so there, so the, legis the legislation doesn't have sort of like strict, strict guardrails, if you will, around these training programs that, that can be created from Digital Equity Act and the BEAT Act is there aren't any strict guardrails that say you cannot include other types of skills training, but they have to obviously include uh, digital skills training. So I hope that answers that, that question. Um, and there's some great resources. National Skills Coalition was our partner on this research, and they have some great resources on how you can advocate for investments and um, you know, some proven digital skills strat uh, strategies, digital skill building strategies. They have a report that's linked here and we can, and I'll definitely share this presentation. So you have all the links and all the data, um, but they have some great insights into sort of you know, building some digital skills programs, connecting with um, training, provi connecting training providers and employers together. So a lot of strategies in, in their report uh, another thing that 
you know, that folks can do. So another provision in the Digital Equity Act and the BEAT Act is that there is funding to close equity gaps for covered populations, right? So what's the covered population? We're thinking rural populations. We're thinking um, traditionally and historically uh, marginalized populations. So we're thinking, you know, women, people of color, right? And so you can actually use census data to sort of drill down in your state, in your MSA, to understand where workers are and then create training programs from where workers are to where you hopefully want them to go, right? So this is a quick example of that. So we're looking at US labor market here. We're looking at industry representation. So we saw at the top of the presentation, right? I'm calling your attention to the left side of this table. We saw at the, at the top of the presentation that um, information, tech, information sector, you know, finance and insurance, these sectors at the top here had the highest demand for digital skills. We saw that digital skills pay, the more digital skills you have, the more, uh, the more pay you get, right? At the bottom here, we see some of the, sec some of the industries that have the lowest uh, demand for digital skills. And then on the right side, what we're looking at here is representation across these industries. And so the legend here, we have green, which means that representation is above parity. So what do I mean by parity? Parity means sort of uh, uh, the population, you know, the, the distribution of, of, of the demographic groups in the population. So for example, Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, workers are about set, make up about 7% of the labor market. Black and African American workers make up about 12% of the labor market. So if you're at parity in an industry, your labor market representation equals your industry representation, right? And so if you're below parity, that means you're underrepresented in that industry. And so what we're seeing here is that, so, so, what, so what can be done here is, you know, training programs and initiatives can be created to help ensure that there's parity across these industries, right? So that there isn't overrepresentation of workers in industries that might pay less and have less digital skills if we can get those workers from the low demand industries to the highest demand digital skills industries, we can start seeing sort of um, pay equity and you know equity in general, right? And so the dig the BEAD Act and the digital and the uh, and the, I'm sorry, the BEAD Act. I'm like blanking right now. The Digital Equity Act and the BEAD Act uh, have provisions in there to create programs to to have sort of to sort of start building out that equity. And also you can embed digital skills training into existing workforce training programs, right? So these are not limited to just programs that can come out of the BEAT Act and the Digital Equity Act. A lot of existing uh, workforce training programs actually allow for digital skills training. Some of them have no, they don't say that you can't be included, right? Um, and so sometimes it's, it's a misconception that some of the existing funding sources and some of the existing program, uh, some of the existing initiatives out there from the government don't allow you to do digital, skill, digital skills training, but that's just, that's just not the case, right? You definitely can um, include digital skills training in some of the existing, existing initiatives. Um, and another, another thing, right? If you're, if you're building out a training program, you want to you bring, wanna bring workforce to the table. You want to bring education stakeholders to the table. You want to bring employers to the table. Another thing that we see a lot happening is uh, sometimes training providers are assuming the the, 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 the skills that employers need. And it turns out it's not the skills that employers need, right? So we want to get employers, uh, we want to get employers and training providers talking to each other. We want to get industry associations talking, you know, at the table as well. So that everyone is talking to each other so that we all know the skills that are needed. Um, and going back to the, those foundational skills, right? Um, having the, building out those foundational skills as opposed to employer specific skills or industry specific skills, focusing on foundational skills first allows workers to like on the job. Usually if you have a, a good baseline understanding, you can pick up, you know, the, the industry or, or platform specific skills that your job is going to require, right? Like for example, I'm most of us probably did not have to do a training on Zoom to use Zoom because we have those foundational uh, skills, right? And so foundational knowledge is, I would say, is much more important than building out employer-specific skills. And so just closing us out here, you know, again, we're, we're going to send out this 
this deck, which has all which has all the links uh, to, for the report. Um, so happy to take any additional questions um, that you all might have. Love the chat. Right. Um, so appreciate everything you shared with us. I think everyone asking for the data is a clear indication that um, it's super interesting and something that we're all really excited about. Um, so y'all keep the questions coming um, as we continue the conversation. Um, but, you know, I think that we've really seen um, the fact that we've gotten, um, you know, so many more digital skills. But I was wondering if you could talk about maybe through your research, um, why y'all found that some of these misconceptions still exist, that this is only like a tech specific thing and this isn't something that's kind of um, embedded in everything else. I know like we did some research at the very beginning of the pandemic and one of our questions was, you know, asking folks, you know, do you think that industries are going to continue to change long term? And most people were like, oh, no, we're just going to go backwards, um, which surprised us. But I was curious, too, um, what maybe y'all have seen in terms of where are those misconceptions existing? And then, you know, maybe are people kind of starting to realize that um, we've kind of made some long term shifts that we're not going to move back from? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, from talking to folks, doing interviews and just looking at the data, um, I think one thing that sort of a lot of people sort of go back to right is a time when um you know software development and coding was like a was like it was becoming less of uh, a novel thing and was becoming more popular in jobs um there was this um uh this societal push i guess if you will to get people teach people how to code right and then there was this notion and you know people started pushing back saying like everyone doesn't want to know how to code everyone doesn't want to be a software developer and so I think that narrative made folks believe or it put in our minds that digital skills and were, were all about coding and software development and mobile app development. I think that that earlier misconception, uh, you know, that that digital skills training meant coding and meant that, that sort of thing. Uh, I think we still have that thinking, right? So I think, you know, hopefully this report and other reports like it are reprogramming us to realize that it's not just about coding, it's not just about software development, um, it's not just about you know working in IT. That we all are using digital skills. We all have been using digital skills, right? Uh, but seeing it in the jobs numbers, seeing that 92 percent of jobs require digital skills, and it's not just tech. I think that also helps with the narrative shift. Uh, I think you know personally, I believe that um, you know. There should be, be you no know, digital literacy and digital skills should be should be um, a bigger part of the educational system, right? We teach numeracy, we teach folks how to how to how to count, how to do math, basic math. We teach literacy and writing, and really we teach those things so that we can get jobs later on, right? And so digital skills, ninety two percent of jobs require digital skills. This should also be being taught in schools as well. We literally had that in recommendations that came out like. February of 2020. Um, and it was one of those things we worked with a lot of K-12 and higher education partners and really found the fact too that, you know, um, maybe it's Python now, but in five years, no one will use Python, um, but you still need that ability to learn and kind of those foundational literacy skills um, so that you're able to continue to reskill, retool as we know that new technologies are coming available. Um, so Absolutely. could not agree more, um, it's crazy. I'll just add on to that, right? So, you know, I, I do know how to code in Python, but I learned how to code in Stata when I was in grad school. Uh, but having that foundational understanding of coding in Stata allowed me to then learn how to code in Python because the foundation is very similar, right? If you know how to navigate Microsoft Word, you know how to navigate Microsoft Office, you can probably learn how to navigate another software program because there's just some foundational, the bones of a program, right, of a software are pretty similar. Right, knowing how to go to the menu, knowing how to click through things. That's that, those are the foundational skills that are sort of tran uh, uh, tra transformational across across platforms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I did want to know we actually use Lightcast all the time. It's great service, um, but we always look at what are those top job postings, and it's always registered nurses, software developers, and it used to be tractor truck trailers. It's been retail lately. So if you're curious, but we still need software developers. So not everyone has to do it. Some, still need yes. them, yeah. <laughs> um, but we've got some more questions. Um, and Cherry's got a great question about how does the inequity of access to the internet and computers play into this research, which I think really hits 
rural parts of the state, as well as um, a lot of urban areas that are underserved too. So we'd love to see what y'all got from those research. Absolutely, right? Um, and that's exactly it. So you know, there's there's so there's 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 two ways to think about sort of access, right, to internet. There's folks who just don't have any internet access at all because maybe you live in a rural community or maybe you live in an urban community where either you don't have access or the internet is so slow that you basically don't have access, right? And a lot of jobs, you you get them through going online, right? You get them through, you go to Indeed, you go to some sort of online platform to apply to jobs. And so what we we actually, one of my coworkers put out a report recently that showed uh, areas that don't have access to jobs actually have a lower actually have uh, tend to have lower median incomes in those areas as well because the jobs that you have access to don't require usually don't require digital skills or require less digital skills and we know that those jobs actually do pay less right and uh folks who are in sort of broadband deserts if you will tend to also work more locally in those communities because they don't have access to the jobs that are outside of their their communities right they're probably getting jobs through word of mouth or through uh, the place that they visit. So it really does limit not it, 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 it's a it's a it's a barrier, it's a hindrance on on pay, but it also is a limit to your access and your ability to um, get other other jobs as well. And so the and so actually so this is another thing that the Digital Equity Act hopes to solve, right? By building out infrastructure, there's infrastructure funding built into these programs as well. So building out that infrastructure gets people access to the internet, uh, but that, it doesn't stop there, right? You can't just bring infrastructure to a rural community and expect folks to just start using the internet, right? There's device training, right? So if you're in, a, in an area that doesn't have internet, you it, it's also highly likely that uh, there's a gap in, in, in having devices and having that basic computer literacy and device literacy. And so that also is going to be a challenge as well. We have to get infrastructure, but we also have to get device training and basic computer literacy training to those areas. No, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think it's a super important part of, of how do we, you know, think about equity across the board, um, not only for adults currently that are trying to upskill, reschool, go and reinforce, but that future generation too, which we know is so important. Um, I've got a great question too from Jack about how do y'all think the that AI will kind of impact this? I know it's still so new and evolving really quickly, but would love to get your thoughts on, on what the impact could be long term. Sure. So there's a lot of predictions out there, right? We know that. Uh, we know that uh, some folks saying AI is going to replace most or all of the jobs. Um, and and to be honest with you, it's a thing that we just don't know, right? Economy. I'm not an economist, but economists and people who are doing this work. Uh, economists are, are, I'll just say it, I work at the Federal Reserve, but, you know, economists are bad at predicting things, right? You never know what's going to happen. Um, all we can all we can do, what I do or what I talk about is relying on historical and on historical um, of what we've seen in the past. What we've seen in the past, we can go back hundreds of years, right, to, industri to the first industrial revolution, right? What we've seen in the past is that there is always this concern that new technology is going to replace all jobs. It never ends up being that way, right? It always ends up create. It always ends up creating more jobs than we've seen destroy. That we've seen. That we've seen go away. For example, look at the iPhone. Uh, I used to work at Best Buy when the iPhone first came out, and people thought the iPhone was going to be the biggest job killer in the world, right? Because at Best Buy, we used to sell GPSs, we used to sell MP3 players, we used to sell cameras. The iPhone came out, and as it got as it improved. You no longer needed a different camera. You no longer needed a different GPS. You no longer needed a separate MP3 player, right? You no longer needed, uh, as, it, as it got better, you can do your web browsing on, on your iPhone as well. And iPhone has not killed jobs, right? We still have a strong labor market. And so I use that example to show, and Best Buy is still thriving, right? Best Buy hasn't gone out of business because of the iPhone. Um, so I use that example to show that we just don't know the technologies that AI is going to create because we can't see the future, right? But historically, we have seen that technology has created more jobs than it has destroyed. I don't think anybody wants to go back to not having an iPhone, right? I think going back not having an iPhone will probably destroy more jobs uh, than than uh, than than had not having it than have to, having not had it in the first place. No, absolutely, and, and I think that what we really hear consistently is the fact that you know um, it'll a lot of this technology is going to automate kind of the more mundane parts of your job. Um, 
And so really we're going to have to make sure that our talent is more capable than they've ever been before about doing things that are innately human, critical thinking, problem solving, all of those things. Um, and so Absolutely. it's super critical that we are really, you know, focus on that part um, because a lot of those routine skills um, that may have been the majority of someone's job, you know, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. just not going to exist in the new economy. Absolutely. And, you know, and another thing that we see is as an area, as um, uh, an area becomes more digitalized, uh, we do see education requirements going up. Uh, employers are sort of uh, conflating digital skills, digital knowledge with having a college degree. And so that's something that we want to push back against, right? You don't have to have, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to prevent degree inflation. We're trying to get employers to remove those degrees and not using a degree as a um, as an indicator of, of of having digital skills, right? And so we just this, this messaging to employers, right? That you know a degree doesn't necessarily a degree should not be a barrier to entry for a job that doesn't actually require a degree, right? But on our end, training providers and practitioners, we do have to ensure that the workforce has those basic digital. Uh, digital skills, digital literacy, so that employers can feel confident that, you know, hiring someone without a degree, they can still get the job done, which is the case, right? We've seen a lot of examples where digital skills training uh, produces workers who are just as productive as anyone else. And I think certainly too, we've continued to see lots of providers that are still providing this kind of skill-based training without necessarily like a formal degree program at, you know, whether it's an associate's or four-year degree, master's, PhD, we're seeing more and more of that kind of um, training pop up because it is really responding to the needs of individuals in the workforce as well as industry. So, you know, I think it'll be really interesting to see how do we see those kinds of trainings pop up. Um, so, which I think we've got time for one more question. So, um, you know, kind of thinking about all that, understanding the fact that we've got to continue to upskill, reskill, you know, the skills that people have now um, won't necessarily be the skills that we need in five years. Um, and based on y'all's research, what advice would you have for kind of private companies as well as public entities that are engaged with people that are in, trying to enter the workforce, trying to upskill on how they create some of these programs that provide some of the digital skills? Do you have some best practices, things to yeah. be mindful of? Um, what would y'all recommend? Sure. Um, I won't name the employer, but I had a conversation with an employer who created a, it's, it's a larger employer, right? So they had the resources to do this, but they created a, a platform for their workers and for their staff to sort of get digital skills trained, to learn new technologies and to just upskill themselves in general. And then they said no one was using it. Well, no one was using it because they didn't give the employers the space and the time, they were, sorry, the workers the space and the time to actually use the platform, right? So I, my so one thing that I would press upon employers is that if you want to uh, ensure that, 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 your, that your staff, that your employees have digital, that they have the digital skills of the future and that they're acquiring the latest skills to ensure that your business is going to remain productive and going to remain um, uh, competitive, give your workers the space, the time, to do some professional development to grow their to grow their digital skills, right? Uh, rely and, and and of course it's harder for a smaller for smaller employers to create sort of their own digital skills program, digital skills training programs. But there's a lot of free things out there, right? There's LinkedIn Learning. There's a lot of free platforms. Um, there's Data Camp. There's a bunch of different things out there uh, that uh, that allow for all types of different digital skills training. Indeed, I believe might have some, uh, or at least they have assessments. I don't think they have training. They have assessments. Uh, but employers should think about making sure that their employees have the time. They, they incorporate training into their into their um, into their day to day or into their work week. And what we find is that when employers actually invest in their employees in that way, give them the, the training and, and give them the space to do training and to upskill themselves, retention actually goes up. Right. So a lot of employers are concerned that oh, if I get them the training, they're just going to leave, go somewhere else, and make more money. Well, what we see is that while that does happen. On, uh, for the most part, most employees are staying because they feel appreciative that their employer has given them a chance to, to learn new skills, and then you get a paid bond as well, right? Um, so that's definitely something that, employer, that employers can think about. Employers can also think about smaller employers, especially, you know, join your, join your local uh, 
association, right? A bunch of, if, if a lot of small employers get together and say, these are the skills that we need, if the workforce, local workforce does not have it, you can go to your local community colleges, lo your local training providers and say, hey, you know, as a collective, we've identified that these are the skills that we need. We, the workforce doesn't have them. Can you create a training program to ensure that the workforce has these skills? You have a louder, smaller employers have a louder voice when they work as a collective. Bigger employers, your Amazons, your Walmarts, they can create their own training programs. They can send one person down to community college and say, hey, I'm Amazon, we need this. Small employers have to collaborate to get that same effect. But absolutely, I think if you work with a lot of small employers, you all know, come together and the technical college system would be happy to agree, a great partner and kind of make sure we're addressing those needs. So I think that's absolutely. all great information. Um, Nye, again, thank you so much for the insights you've shared this morning. I think everyone is really excited about the research you all have done and what you've been able to share this morning. Um, so again, thank you for your presentation um, and for everything that the Fed does in Atlanta. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. All right, we will wrap up y'all and get you back to the rest of your Friday. Um, if you are not a member of Max, um, we would love for you to become a member. Um, Max Minutes is um, open to everyone. We've got lots of other programs that um, are exclusive to membership in Max. So if you've got questions, please reach out to myself or Joy, who knows all things about Max and can answer all of your questions. Um, but these are some of the resources um, and would love to get you more plugged in. Again, a big thanks to our anchor investors who make all of our programs possible, um, especially Georgia Express Link Partners, which is, again, our newest anchor investor. Um, appreciate all they do to support workforce development. And that's all um, for us this morning. Again, I hope you all have a great Friday, great weekend. Um, and thanks again for joining us tonight and for everyone for participating. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Joy. Happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. See ya.